Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Have a great show for you today, but before we get to that, I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. It's a fairly simple process. You just go to audiobooks.com and register, sign up, and you pay $14 a month, and every month you get to listen to a premium book, one that often costs 30 or more dollars. For the price of 14 a month, you get a book to listen to that's a premium book. Audiobooks.com. Check them out. Our book today is Truly Texas Mexican, written by Adan Medrano. Now, Adan got his training at the CIA. (laughs) Well, that's uh, Culinary Institute of America, but uh, it's fun to say it that way. And his book, Truly Texas Mexican, is a little different take. It's not Tex-Mex, as you might think. It digs deeper and goes into the deeper roots of Texas cooking back to the Native uh, Americans who were here long before Texas was here. And this book has gotten a good deal of praise on Amazon. Uh, Some of the people who have bought it have said things like, I got this book on a recommendation from my surgeon. He's a great surgeon, and now I love him for his taste in cooking. This book rules our house, and it is now a staple there in our kitchen. And uh, here's another. I met Mr. Medrano at a demonstration he gave in Houston. His book is more than just a cookbook. It tells you about the history and the regions that the foods came from. So we're going to talk to him about his unique take on this. This book was published by Texas Tech University Press and has been widely praised around Texas. So we will all learn together about how to become better cooks of Texas Mexican cuisine. And um, we will learn to have a better understanding of the historical roots of the things in our kitchen. Good morning, Adan. How are you? Good morning, William. I'm doing well. <laughs> Hope you're well. Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Where are you this morning? I am in uh, Falfurrias, Texas. I arrived last night, and I'm looking forward to the Fiesta del Rancho. What is which that? Which will be happening uh, in Concepcion. It has been going on for 50 years, and it's a big fair that brings together the the folk who live uh, around the ranches uh-huh. in this area. And there's a rodeo, there's uh, cook-offs, there's cabrito cook-offs, and uh, food booths and, uh, and musical entertainment from the area. So it's a, it's a great fair, and I'm looking forward to it. It starts tonight. Do you cook there? No, I'm not uh, going to cook there, but I am going to eat an awful lot. <laughs> uh, um, I'm working on my next book, uh, mm-hmm. which is the follow-up to Truly Texas Mexican, and uh, in my first book, I, I said I would not deal with outdoor cookery because it's so, it's so important and uh, it's so varied, and uh, it, I'll be dealing with it in my next book. So I'm going to go taste some of the recipes that uh, the food booths will uh, cook, mm-hmm. and uh, as in my book, in Truly Texas Mexican, every recipe has a family tradition, and that's what interests me a great deal. Because um, did you, if you got the recipe from your mother, when did she cook it? How did it make you feel? There's a lot of the history and heritage that resides in recipes, mm-hmm. and that's of high interest to me. Well, you have said that uh, food is culture, and, and uh, can you elaborate on that theme? In what ways is food culture? There are there are many uh, uh, instances in my childhood when uh, memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, became a reality. Uh, that That is, it was the seed of memory that was formed. Uh, my mother making uh, frijoles refritos, uh, well-fried beans. Uh-huh. To this day, I remember how it was very specific to our family, and when I went to school and others uh, had uh, luncheon meat, bologna and, uh, <laughs> and cheese, and I had a frijol taco, Uh it was part of my identity, and I remember clearly feeling that uh, my family had a specific cultural uh, being, and Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I think food acts. It it really focuses on our identity. And the second thing it does is a cultural trait is it helps us uh, foment hospitality. Food allows us to to invite other people to 
to share with us, to share their ideas, worldviews, and talk. And it's a very welcoming type of art form. Well, one thing I really like about your book is that, uh, you know, you're not a, even though you went to the Culinary Institute of America, uh, you're not a food snob. You embrace uh, food that is uh, what a lot of us would call comfort food. Yes, I'm very glad you said that. I I, I was giving a talk at uh, when I went to uh, Harvard, the... the um, Food anthropologists uh, were very interested in the history part of, of the book. And the fact that it is comfort food, it is home cooking, uh, was something that they underscored and asked me about. And the, the problem that comes with food snobbery is that it's very, it can tend to be very precious. And it focuses on ingredients, techniques, who is right, who is wrong, who is doing it right, Mm -hmm. who is doing it wrong, and these are oppositional types of reviews. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with them that um, if you take an anthropological view of food, then the process of making the food, of gathering the ingredients, and then sharing becomes part part of the art form. So to me, home cooking can happen also in a restaurant when the restaurant really takes into account hospitality, and uh, and the environment, and I think most good restaurants really do that. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I like um, I, I I like to juxtapose a food snob uh, <laughs> with a food fascist. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's a what is a, a meal that uh, you could recommend that uh, your average family could cook that would reconnect them to roots in in a powerful way? Excellent. They'd have, uh, that's uh, three ingredients, and uh, um, the first would be uh, tortillas, uh-huh. tortillas de harina, flour, uh, wheat flour, corn flour tortillas, uh-huh. and, uh, which are the recipes in my book. The second would be well-fried beans, frijoles refritos, mm-hmm. and the third on the plate would be um, carne guisada. And, and I think you, everybody in the in South Texas and San Antonio and they, everybody knows carne guisada and yes. has eaten it in their home. There probably are a thousand different variations depending on your family. Yes. Well, Did you you had it right? You oh yes, yes, it? yes, yes. I grew up with it. The uh, I mean, we didn't cook it in in my house because we were you know we were your traditional Anglo family with a Midwestern sort of cuisine. But growing up in an Hispanic area, right there in Falfurias, where you are, as a matter of fact. Uh, we couldn't help but have the Hispanic cuisine creep into, you know, uh, our Midwestern cuisine. So at, at uh, Thanksgiving, we would have turkey and tamales, you know, <laughs> they were, oh, right. the, the blend. And now I, I notice that across Texas, that tradition or that trend has been magnified more and more. Uh, I, I remember reading, it must have been 10 years ago or more, that it, it kind of shocked me that salsa had passed... Uh, ketchup, ketchup as yes. uh, as uh, you know the primary condiment uh, in Texas and uh, and and it's continued in in that direction a lot of anglos for instance uh, never were much into tacos uh, when i was young but now it's all the rage isn't that interesting i i i um i marvel at how um now that we are noticing tacos and mm-hmm. salsa mm-hmm. being so prevalent we're beginning to see that food is uh, is a process, mm-hmm. and it, it's not very distinct within this or that category. The in the book, I make a distinction between truly Texas between Texas Mexican food and Tex-Mex food, mm-hmm. and uh, Texas Mexican food uh, I define as the one of the several regions of Mexican cuisines. There is no one cuisine of um, Mexican food. There are. Many, for mm-hmm. example, um, if you go to the coast of Tehuantepec and uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, that's one type. Uh, the moles in Oaxaca, for example, are another. And Texas Mexican is part of the larger sort of regional Mexican food. And uh, Tex-Mex begins in the 1900s as a strictly restaurant food um, that uh, is not home cooking, but is a development. But what I wanted to mention is in these two examples, you see that food really travels and becomes different things. Mm-hmm. When uh, when salsa enters the general U.S. population and becomes so popular, I'm reminded that my mother started to make biscuits very much like your mother would be, would in the Midwest. Right. And she would put jelly and she would make, make uh, 
gravy, and she learned this because she had friends who were in um, Robstown and in other places cooking that because they were European Mm family European families. And I think uh, food goes back and forth like that. And if we're willing to accept that it's cultural, I think we can have a much more welcoming community. Well, I heard you once say that in Texas uh, that we have foods that are, you might call, indigenous, that they weren't brought here by the Mexicans or the Europeans, that they existed before, uh, you know, any, any of these uh, migrants, so to speak, arrived. And what, what are those? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. In my book, I make a, um, in one section, I say that Texas Mexican food is indigenous to this land. That is the north of the Rio Grande, mm-hmm. and it existed here, beginning ten thousand years ago when Native Americans were cooking. And uh, just as the Native Americans of Texas were here when the Native Americans of Oaxaca, Yucatan, and other parts of Mexico were there, Chiapas included. Mm -hmm. We are a people's uh, indigenous to the land, but we're called Mexican because of the country. So the food that we cooked is now the Mexican-American home-style cooking. And uh, it's the corn tortillas, uh, the use of chiles, uh, cactus, Mm -hmm. uh, all of the foods that we eat with deer, uh, beef jerky, and uh, the beauty of the Texas Mexican food is that we married the European Im- immigrants' foods. Mm-hmm. So you have lovely flour tortillas and uh, enchiladas that are thickened with wheat flour. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are some of the recipes that are in my book. They're all home-style cooking, but they really do depend on both the European and the indigenous peoples. But it's really an indigenous cuisine. Is there anything that's gone the other way? I mean, we have in Texas a lot of influence of Mexican cuisine. Is uh, is there anything that's traveled from Texas to Mexico? Uh, I would I would point out two categories. One one is uh, the foods that were born in Texas, the indigenous cuisine, and how it evolved uh, when it when it when it uh, dealt with the European ingredients. The other is uh, all of the influences of uh, German, Czech. French uh, uh, influences on the local cuisine. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are really, for example, all the desserts Mm -hmm. that we have, pan dulce, uh, all of that comes from the French tradition of baking. So that's a wonderful uh, French addition to the cuisine. And uh, the Native Americans were already making sausage, pemmican, you know, is Mm -hmm. the deer sausage. We were already making that uh, 10, 000, well, 5,000 years ago. So when the Germans arrive, and of course they're wonderful at making sausage, um, <laughs> yes, we very quickly adopted that, and now any Mexican-American cookout is going to have you know, sausage. So, so it's, a, it's a wonderful confluence of the various cultures. But I think, as I mentioned in my book, the delicious way that the indigenous peoples uh, made their own cuisine is is what we enjoy in the Mexican restaurants. So chorizo was influenced by German sausage making? Yes, the hard chorizo, like country mm-hmm. sausage. That oh, we I eat. see. Yes, the, uh, the chorizo of the, the Mexican chorizo was uh, influenced by, you know, the, the, the chiles and the, a lot of the Arab and Indian uh, India from India, not Indians, Native Americans, that came with the Spaniards. For example, in the Mexican chorizo, you have cinnamon, a little bit of clove, all of this very Arabic Indian types of uh, traditions. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're, you're a well-traveled man. You've been all over uh, Europe, South America. Uh, what is the modern uh, export potential, so to speak, of, of the Texas Mexican cuisine. What's what's being used in Europe that came from here? Uh, you know, when I was when I was in uh, Berlin, mm-hmm. I was in London, Sweden. They had they all had Mexican restaurants. Amsterdam they had Mexican restaurants with a picture of the Our Lady of Guadalupe on the sign outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, but I thought I was back in Harlingen, <laughs> and so, and uh, they they simply love uh, enchiladas, tacos. And uh, the the uh, the rest Mexican restaurants in Mumbai, India, have uh, typically served what they call Tex-Mex, mm-hmm. and that's food with a lot of yellow cheese, 
very gooey and uh, tons of uh, lettuce. And uh, last year, the uh, Wall Street Journal ran an article about how they, the people in Mumbai, the restaurateurs, have found a, a less expensive way to, to import chiles and the fresher ingredients of, uh, of Mexico, and they're doing it through some Texas connections. So we're having uh, influence there. I'm happy to say that the the most uh, popular chef there of Mexican food n- mentioned my book <laughs> as his inspiration. So wow, that's um, great. I, I think I think the fact that Texas is such an important uh, center of commerce, you know, with our railroad, with the Houston uh, Ship Channel, yes, and other uh, vehicles of uh, of commerce, I think that puts us in a really interesting position to influence. Uh, with our Texas Mexican food. If you were going to be uh, traveling somewhere for, let's say I, were gonna, I was going to send you to Central Africa for whatever reason, and I'd say, okay, uh, you can't, you're going to have to take with you what you're going to want there to cook with. Uh, what spices would, can you not live without? Oh, my goodness. I want my chile serrano. <laughs> <laughs> And that is my favorite chili. I grew uh-huh. up with it. And in the morning when I scramble the eggs, I, I go to the icebox and I take out a green, fresh chili serrano and I bite it. <laughs> 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 That'll wake you up. That'll wake you up, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my favorite chili. It's very versatile. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, tortillas would be uh, another staple. I remember when Archbishop uh, Flores, the first Mexican-American bishop to be named a bishop in the Catholic Church, was uh, consulted by the army because they were having sort of uh, morale difficulties with the uh, Mexican-American recruits when they were in Germany and other places. And then they, mm-hmm. So they asked, please talk to the troops. What do they want? And they thought it was going to be some exotic uh, management and rules and obedience and that sort of thing. And you know what he said? He said, they want tortillas. <laughs> 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 That's what they want. <laughs> they wanted tortillas in the mess hall. And uh-huh. the general said, is that all? <laughs> yep, that's it. But, you know, that's so important. Food is so important to the way we feel, the way we connect to each other. Mm-hmm. It reminds us, it has memories of our families. And so I think, um, I'm hoping that more cookbooks will take the line that I did with this cookbook, and that is really link the food to history and culture. Well, that is what I like about your book, is that it is linked, it is a, it is a cookbook that helps you cook right now great things, but it also gives you the uh, historical connection to the roots of that food. It really does. And, you know, when, when you mentioned during your class, by the way, thank you for inviting me to address yes. your class. Yes. Uh, during the class, when you mentioned the history of the relationships between uh, some of the Karankawa tribes and other tribes, and there was already some warfare and animosity existing, and then the Europeans arrived, um, when you asked that question about how that worked, it was really important because I had left out that dimension of the history because if we look back at the food and how we dealt with each other, it just helps us better understand who we are as Texans and the various communities that eventually came together. So uh, that, that was important. Well, if we go back uh, you know, to the earliest record that we have of someone walking across Texas, uh, it's Cabeza de Vaca and his journals that he left behind. <clears throat> and... Um, what do we learn from his journals about the food that was common at that time? Yes, we're so fortunate that he wrote this down. Of course, he wrote it for the king, and it was a reconnoitering process. And um, some of the things that struck me were the vegan types of foods. Uh, down in Coahuila, a little bit south of the Rio Grande, uh, there, he, he mentions uh, pine nuts mm-hmm. and... Uh, an herb that I can't, and they would mix it together, dry it, and carry it as a food. He also mentions, of course, cactus and the pecans, and then the wide variety of fish. So oftentimes we forget that Texas Mexican food has a heavy emphasis on seafood mm-hmm. from the ocean, clams, oysters, mm-hmm. redfish, red snapper, and also uh, uh, river fish. And he mentions all of those, and that's very helpful to us to know. They would catch them with lines, sometimes with nets. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also ate uh, freshwater clams. And uh, 
we can't do that anymore right now because many of our waterways have become polluted. Mm. But they did. And, of course, they also ate snails, as the French do with their escargot. Mm-hmm. Oh, so uh, there was a, quite a variety of uh, foods. I read, you know, the, I read Cabeza de Vaca's journal, or reread it, about two years ago and just was more fascinated than ever because of the, uh, you know, his brutal time here <laughs> as uh, yes. partially enslaved uh, or mostly enslaved, actually. Anyway, the the part that I, I found fascinating in the book is that the tribe he was with would uh, go every spring down to South Texas, probably somewhere around modern-day Kingsville, and and they would go all the way down there and stay about three or four weeks for the bloom of the cactus so they could eat the, uh, you know, the cactus fruit. Uh, the tuna, what do they call it? Yes, that's right, la tuna. La tuna. It was, yes. And he talked I about like how they would gorge themselves on the, they'd travel all this way, you know, they walk 200 miles to go camp for three weeks and just eat those. It was great. I also uh, remember that. He did say they gorge themselves mm-hmm. because it's sweet, it's delicious. I, um, Do you use them in your cooking ever? I didn't include any recipes uh, in my in my in my cookbook, but I intend to this next next one. Okay. Uh, we ate tunas all the time, of course, when I was growing up. And uh, the interesting thing about the cactus uh, that I mention in the book is to it makes us realize that the cactus and the tuna was not so widespread throughout South Texas and Central Texas as it is now, that uh, because of that, those areas were pampas of grass. Mm-hmm. And I mean, not pampas, they were savannas of grass. Right. And uh, the water table was much higher. But uh, at, when uh, we imported so many cows and sheep and goats, the overgrazing was 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 very, very bad, also in Coahuila and Chihuahua, mm. so that um, the grasslands disappeared, and as the, as the cows traveled, they, dis- <laughs> they took with they them took the you seeds, know, the seeds yeah. of, the, of the low brush. So mm. now we have low brush and cactus and mesquite and very low water levels, and uh, this, happened, uh, this began to happen around 300 years ago. Mm. And the reason I like to mention that is not that we want to go back or go over mistakes, but simply it, it, by looking bad, it really helps us better understand food production and how best to move forward. Well, let's talk about your, your new book. This one is going to be devoted to outdoor cooking? Yes, it's going to be outdoor cooking and some of the important uh, family restaurants that have been in existence in Texas for over 40 years. Hmm. And so it uh, it takes uh, the food of my family, which was the first mm-hmm. book, and exp- ex- extends it to see that the reach of Texas Mexican food is very, very broad. Uh, you know, the thing is, I'm here in uh, Falfurias because I've got to taste all of this beautiful food. <laughs> I have to finish a, the book very it's soon. A, it's a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? It's a tough job uh, you have there. It's called, uh, the working title is The Art of Texas Mexican Cooking. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I'm going to link it to more family stories. And uh, some of the recipes are uh, cabrito, Mm -hmm. that's guisado. You know, mostly it's roasted, but here in South Texas, they they guisado, they saute it, they cook it like a little stew. So I'm going to cook those recipes. We're going to have quail and some interesting uh, recipes like uh, bean candy. (laughs) Bean candy? Never heard of that. Bean candy. I hadn't, but uh, there's a recipe, and people make it here. So those things to explore other avenues of the food that we have that's so delicious. You know, the best uh, jerky I ever had was uh, when I was on the King Ranch down there in Brooks County as a kid. And I you know, was out deer hunting, and we came upon uh, you know, one of those little camps that they have. And uh, there was a Mexican guy who had cooked a bunch of uh, uh, or prepared a lot of jerky, and he gave me some, and it was just magnificent. I've never, mm. never had anything anywhere close to as good as that. And was that beef? Yes, yes, beef. Oh, beef jerky, and it was just salted and just wonderful. And, and uh, so uh, it has been my standard, uh, you know, to compare all jerkies to ever since, and nothing has measured up. Isn't that great? Yeah. So maybe and it stays with you, doesn't it? That's another mm-hmm. facet of Texas Mexican food that. Mm-hmm. 
families find very important and connects you to families, and that is your body tells you when the recipe is right. You know, like your your sense of taste, like you just mentioned, you know and you remember that this jerky does not taste like like the really nice one that you had. It's a wonderful way of your body being in command of food. Well, that's what I hope you're able to capture in your next book is all of those uh, beautiful, um, you know, cultural recipes of, of these uh, what we might call authentic cooks from long ago. I, I um, am really attempting to do that. I think what, it will, what will happen is that food will then invite us to sit at the table where all are welcome. Texas history is fraught with a lot of hostility, a lot of wars, discrimination, racism, uh, horrible violence. And uh, my hope is that uh, we don't want to ignore these. We want to know what they are. We want to tell them, but tell them in a space where reconciliation is possible. And I think when it comes down to it, German sausage, the Czech food, the French pastries, the Texas Mexican food incorporates many of these aspects. And the reason it is, you know, Texas uh, can be, you know, one community that can be can be very rich. And that's the whole point of my next book. Peace through food. That's, that's true. <laughs> and, and, and celebratory peace. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Adan. I'm, I've enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure people will, will love your book. You can get it on Amazon, you can download it, you can order it there, or uh, Barnes and Noble, or any of the uh, any of the typical bookstores where you would uh, normally uh, shop for books. So, thanks again for joining us for Good Books Radio. I'm Dr. W. F. Strong signing off. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads. <laughs>